Okay, let me start in verse 9, and that should ring a bell to everybody. Uh, I won't go back through. The, in fact, we will, in the next couple weeks, go back over some of the advancement of the Media Persia against Babylon, and mostly about uh, Greece against Media Persia. But eventually we end up with the breaking up of the Grecian Empire and a little horn that comes out of that, which uh, I would believe is the Antichrist from our study of Daniel chapter 7. But it says in verse 9, it says, Out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land. And, a great, uh, and, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even unto the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one of the saints uh, speaking and another said unto that certain saint that which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Uh, if we move good enough, we'll, we'll, we'll actually cover verses 13 and 14. That's what's really on the board there. But uh, we went over verses 9 through 11. We actually studied in detail 11 and 12 last time, but there were some things that just needed to be further said about that. This little horn in, in verse 9 appears to be the Antichrist, and we said from the beginning of Daniel chapter 8 that the, the difference in Dan Daniel chapter 8 is not only Daniel getting the vision, and it's more concerning the nation of Israel, but it focuses in on what Daniel was concerned with in Daniel chapter 7, and that is that little horn. The Antichrist, as we call him, the beast of the, of the book of Revelation. And, uh, and you start getting more identity uh, about who he is. And we see where he's direction he's coming from. So we figure that he's either coming out of the Grecian or, uh, or uh, the what Bible would call Asian uh, territory, which we call Turkey. So he's coming from that direction. Uh, and then he waxed, even, uh, he waxed great even unto the host of heaven. And uh, so he's battling heavenly beings, and some people try to make that human, but I just take it for what it says, the heavenly host is always angels. And it cast some of them of the host of the star and the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. And I believe that that is different ranks within the angelic beings, and sometimes Satan can have some victory over uh, the holy angels. Now, I'm not sure what stamped upon them means. <laughs> you jump them down. Or, I just know that when we get to chapter 10, some are going to be thrown in prison, and that's the good angels. Anyhow, verse 11 is where we're going to start concentrating on now. It says, Yea, he magnified himself even unto the prince of the host, which is either the Lord Jesus Christ, but later on this chapter will talk about the prince of princes, and that is certainly the Lord Jesus Christ. I... When I look at that, I, I think of Michael, the archangel, the prince of the nation of Israel, but an angelic being, the archangel, the top angel. But either way, he magnified himself even unto the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And this is where we were talking last time, where depending on who you read, when you get the word by him, did you switch the person you're talking about? Or... <laughs> Or are you talking about the same little horn that we talked about in verses 9 and 10? A lot of people switch that and say, by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, which if the prince of the host is the Lord Jesus Christ, he took away the daily sacrifice. Um, and, and you can see, and there's, there's logic for that, but if you just keep reading, and it says, by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Is that the Lord's sanctuary, or is it Satan's sanctuary that is cast down? That his there some, makes some people think we're talking about the Lord. But then when you get to verse 12, you still got that pronoun. And an host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression, and it cast the truth to the ground. Now, I can't see that being the Lord. <laughs> So that's why I stick from verses 11 and 12 that all this description is description of what the little horn is going to do. 
going to cast the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So there's some things to say about that. You, you see that it all centers around that daily sacrifice. Now, the daily sacrifice, Israel had a, has a, had a temple, and they would have a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. And uh, when you're reading this chapter, you realize this little horn is going to go up against that sacrifice. So that, that sacrifice has to be in play. play. Uh, and, and so if I'm right about the little horn being the Antichrist, Israel's going to have to have a temple when this takes place, and they're going to have to be sacrificing again when this takes place. Now, I, I probably should give you a little background on the very fact that Daniel, as he's writing this and seeing this vision, there is no temple. It got destroyed when Babylon conquered uh, Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. So Daniel's reading this, and in his mind, oh, the temple's back. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and someday, I might have to do a little bit better, but just now I'll just go over some things with you. That temple was built by Solomon, destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then after Daniel's day, shortly after Daniel's day, Zerubbabel is going to go back to the land and he's going to rebuild the temple. We call that Zerubbabel's temple. And then, the, and then that's gonna, it's going to stand during the time of the Media Persian Empire. That's when it gets built again. The Grecian Empire, it'll be there. But then after that, when Rome started conquering the land, Rome came in and destroyed the temple, Zerubbabel's temple. And that's where we'll talk a little bit about that, Antiochus Epiphanes, in a minute. But destroyed, uh, Rome destroyed that temple, uh, about 167, something like that, B.C. And then... And then just before the New Testament begins, Herod, in order to please the Jews, rebuilt the temple. That's why you read in the book of John where there, uh, Christ said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll build it up again. And he said, was it 80 or 30, 30 and 6 years has this temple been in building? I forget the number of years. So that they, you can actually date when the temple was rebuilt under Herod in, uh, in, uh, before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's a temple when the Lord Jesus Christ came, and then the temple is supposed to have been destroyed again, and it was destroyed because it's not there now, <laughs> in 70 AD. And, uh, but apparently in the tribulation, there's going to be a temple again, and if, this, if I'm right about this being the Antichrist. So you can, you can see how it comes and it goes, but it's always just the temple, no matter who built it, uh, it's, it's the temple. So, but anyhow, this, this temple is built. They're offering the daily sacrifice. Verse 11 says, And he magnified himself even unto the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. I would say that that is Satan's sanctuary. And we'll, in, a, in a little bit, we're going to run some of those verses in the book of Hebrews that, that uh, if this is the tribulation, Israel should not be involved in that temple at all. And the only reason it is, it's all satanic. That's why you, you read these references to transgression. For instance, in verse uh, 12, And a host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression. God is going to allow this to be destroyed because of the transgression. If you look down in verse 13, Then I, then I heard one of the saints speaking unto, me, unto another saint and said unto that certain saint which spake how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation <laughs> and uh, so that uh, this transgression is going to bring destruction and 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 so there's a timing that's given here so this daily sacrifice is set up when i ran through this all this information the last time i told you that i look at this as the antichrist rising the power he has a daily sacrifice and this transgression is not only them having a transgression, but that desolation, a transgression of desolation. There is in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, the Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's going to be seven years when we get there. We'll see that. And in the midst of the week, in the middle of that seven-year period of time, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate. So that what we're talking about here is what Paul describes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that Satan is going to be, want to be worshipped as God, and he's going to set the, an image of himself in the temple and be worshipped as God. And that's the abomination of desolation, that's the transgression of desolation that's going to take place in the middle of the tribulation. 
And, uh, and so he's going to stop the daily sacrifice and then put up an idol of himself and order the world to bow down and worship him. Now let me go back in time a little bit. When most people, most commentaries read this, they say this has already happened. That when, that, when Zerubbabel's temple was destroyed in 167, I probably have come across the notes here, uh, BC, that in order to, uh, to desecrate Israel's temple, that he brought in a pig and offered a pig on the altar in Jerusalem, in the, in the temple in Jerusalem, and, and, and uh, made it unclean and then destroyed the temple. Uh, when you read about it, they actually, that, that's something that uh, he did actually in honor of the Roman uh, gods that they worshiped. And it certainly is a, an insult to the Jews. And when you read about this little horn and all these events, they all relate that to Antiochus Epiphanes and, and that he did that. Uh, he came along once, there it is, 171 uh, BC and 164 BC is when he did, actually the date is December 25th, 167 BC is when he's supposed to have offered up a, a pig on the altar and, and desecrated the temple and, uh, and that was the abomination that they think this is a reference to. You know, when I read that, I thought to myself, wait a minute, I always thought Titus did that. See, <laughs> Herod the Great builds another temple, and then it gets destroyed in 70 AD, and everyone's going to tell you that the temple was destroyed by Titus in 70 AD, and he came in and offered a pig on the altar. <laughs> and when you read history, they both did it, uh, according to what history says. And, uh, and so when I'm reading that, I'm thinking, wait a minute, I thought that was Titus, and it's just like a duplicate thing. Now, either they both did that, and it's possible they did, because they both did it under Roman influence, um, but we know that this is not talking about Titus, the Roman, doing it. Everyone thinks it's about Antiochus. But I, don't, I told you last time, I don't think it's even talking about Antiochus. I think we jumped into the future to the, the little horn, the Antichrist, and some things he's going to do. It doesn't say he's going to offer a pig. He's actually going to offer an image of himself and order the world to bow down, Revelation chapter 13, and, and worship his image. And uh, so I don't believe this was fulfilled back in 167 B.C., um, that if you look at it, you understand why people are saying that. And by the way, when we get to chapter 11, that is really going to be difficult because everybody thinks almost all of, Revel of Daniel chapter 11 has been fulfilled, and they go back to Titus to do all that. And, and I, I look at it like this passage and say, no, it's not been fulfilled yet. Uh, and as, as Carl was talking, just I'm not sure how, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but he's analyzing about, prophecy being fulfilled in the Age of Grace. Well, by 70 AD, you're already well into the Age of Grace, and God's not fulfilling Old Testament prophecy in the Age of Grace. Now, some things might happen that are going to happen in prophecy and look the same, just like when I look at this passage and I listen, I read the things that they say about Antioch Epiphanes, I say, oh, I can see how he looks like that, but I don't believe that's him at all. I believe that's still future to our day. And the reason I do that, look at verse 17. It says, so he came near where I stood, and that's angel Gabriel. Uh, when he came, I was, afright, uh, was afraid and fell on my face and said unto him, oh, and, but he said uh, unto me, understand, O son of man, for, the time, for at the time of the end shall the vision, shall be the vision. Well, I don't think we're talking about 167 B.C. then. He, the, Gabriel is telling him it's going to be at the end, the time of the end. Look at verse 19. It says, And he said, Behold, I will make thee to know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. Well, the end of the world hasn't come yet. And the end of the, Israel's indignation has not ended yet. The things that they have done against God in the last will certainly be to worship an image of a beast, uh, the Antichrist. Uh, that hasn't been fulfilled yet. The end hasn't come yet. Verse 23, it says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressor, transgressors are come to a full, a king of fierce continents and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Israel's transgressions have not come to a full. They certainly will come to a full in the tribulation when the Antichrist sets up an image and they bow down to worship it 
And so looking at verses like that, I'm thinking, no, you're, you're, you're jumping, you're going back into history rather than jumping all the way to the end time that the passage is dealing with and uh, talking about the coming of the Antichrist. It's also, if you come to Matthew 24, now remember, most commentaries are saying this was completed in 167 B.C., so now we're moving out of B.C. into A.D. when Christ was here. And just before Christ died, he's preparing them for his death. But he's giving, the, they asked, what shall be the end? Well, verse 3 of Matthew 24. The disciples, as they sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell, uh, saying, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So he's given a three-point uh, explanation. Verse 15 is all we're going to need here. It says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. When you see that image, standing in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand, then them which are in Jerusalem flee into the mountains. There comes the desolation that's going to take place. My point is, it hadn't happened in Jesus Christ's day yet. So here Jesus Christ is still warning them about the abomination that Daniel talked about. And so it couldn't have been filled, fulfilled in 167 B.C. So I think they're wrong in trying to, that I, can, I can understand looking at history, seeing it, and they do the same in chapter 11. Uh, but that, I believe all these events are going to take place in the tribulation. So going back to Daniel 8 and verse 11, this prince that's going to come along, or this little horn that's going to come along and magnify himself against the prince of the host. He's the one that's by him the daily sacrifice is going to be taken away. He's going to stop Israel from offering those daily sacrifices. And the place of his sanctuary is going to be cast down. So he's, not, he's going to end all of that and start something else. In fact, verse 12 says, And a host is given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression. And all those references to the transgression there is by reason of the trend, God is going to allow all this to happen. When you, when you read, like even Nebuchadnezzar, he was a pawn in God's hand. Well, the Antichrist is going to be a pawn in God's hand. He's going to bring vengeance upon the nation of Israel by letting Satan have his way. We realize in the age of grace, we're hindering what Satan would like to accomplish. But when we're gone, when he that letteth is taken away, then Satan is going to have free course, and God's going to allow him to have free course. God's going to allow him to do all this, to be worshipped as God. And, and, and it's because of the Israel's transgression. Israel, in the tribulation, should know better than ever offering any sacrifice. Hold your place here, come to Hebrews, and let's start in chapter 4. Well, let's start in chapter 6. Now, if you've never read through the book of Hebrews, it's the word better shows up all the time. Because Jesus Christ came, lived under the law. He went to the temple. There were sacrifices, all of that. When he died, the, the, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The way to God is no longer going to be through that way. The way to God now is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Hebrews is explaining that to the nation of Israel using all the types and shadows of the Old Testament to show the reality is in Jesus Christ. He is the new and living way. And that they need to come to God the new and living way. They need to come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And because Israel continued in the book of Acts to reject Jesus Christ, the book of Hebrews is a warning to them that this is going to be their last chance because if they reject Jesus Christ, they're going to receive the Antichrist. They're going to go back to sacrificing and they're going to end up sacrificing to the Antichrist himself. So when you look at Hebrews chapter 6 and, and verse 4, when it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Now that's all Pentecost. The nation of Israel, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the believing remnant, but even the lost Jews saw it. They're asking, what is all this about? Peter tells them that they have another chance to believe in Jesus as their Christ. So they have uh, been partakers of the Holy Ghost, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. If they fall away now, 
There's, it's, not, it's not possible. There's no more offer of repentance. This is the end for the nation of Israel. They get one more chance. And that here, as we approach that tribulation, they have that one more chance. But if they, if they don't repent at this point, there's no more offer. But look what it also says. If they should fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Meaning they crucified Christ a second time. Well, that's figuratively. They're not going to crucify him on a cross a second time, but they are rejecting him a second time. They rejected him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And Father forgave the nation of Israel, gave them one more chance. There is no more offer of repentance after this one more chance. If you reject them again, you crucify them afresh. There's no more sacrifice for sin. There's going to be a judgment that's going to fall. So Israel to rebuild the temple and start offering animal sacrifices and, and ultimately then worshiping the image of the beast. This is all a transgression that God is going to bring judgment upon them for that. Uh, for it's another rejection of Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 8. In verses just 1 and 2 there, it says, Now of the things which we have spoken of, this is the sum. So he's kind of giving you a conclusion up to this point. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. But he's already pointed out Jesus is a, a better priest, uh, after a better, better priesthood, who offered a better sacrifice than the blood of bulls and goats. That's why verse 2 says, A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, and he's going to go on to talk about Christ's sacrifice. Verse 6 says, But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. The new covenant of his blood can give them everlasting life. And, and But notice that reference to the, the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. We're not talking about a human tabernacle. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ taking his blood all the way up to before God the Father in heaven, sprinkling his blood, not the blood of bulls and goats, before God the Father for a propitiation for Israel's sins. And, uh, and all that is better than what Israel had in the shadows of the, of the law. That's what they're called. So come over to chapter 9. In verse 13, it says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and, uh, uh, and, the, and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, that's all it could do, it couldn't purify the soul, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living and true God. They, they got something a lot better than blood of bulls and goats. They got something that actually would purge their sins and their, in their conscience to serve the true God, not the Antichrist. And, uh, and so you see what they're going to. Verse 28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So if they're not looking for him, they're in trouble. And then you got those verses in Hebrews that talk about... Uh, about by one sacrifice, well, verse 10, chapter 10, verse 10, by the which will, the will of God, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And I just remind you how it ends, chapter 13. It says in verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproaches, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And uh, then he talks about offering God the sacrifice of praise. And the point is, is the believing remnant aren't going to participate with what's going on in Jerusalem. They're going to go to Christ outside the camp, outside the city. They're eventually going to be told to flee the city. And... Uh, and so what's taking place in Daniel chapter 8 with this daily sacrifice and all is an abomination already without, without that abomination that's going to bring the desolation and that is the, the final um, 
offering uh, an image of himself for, for them to worship. Um, Well, let me just do this, jump right to it. Now we <laughs> balance that. Now we've already dealt with these days, so I'm not going to remind you of all of this. But there's something in Daniel chapter 8. In verse 13, after he sees all of this, and by the way, verse 8, uh, verse 12, when it ends and says, and it cast the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. The Antichrist program, well, you know, like, like a doctor, he practices medicine. It's only a practice. <laughs> He's still trying to work at it. Uh, you know, the witches, they practice witchcraft. That is, they, they go after that. Well, he's pursuing his his goal of being worshipped as God, and he prospered. That means he's having success. So that, that's the Antichrist, that's where, he's, that's where he's heading and going. Verse 13 says, Then I heard one saint speaking to another saint, and said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be, now catch this, shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So it's all going to be under, under, the, under Gentile control. And so they starts out with the sacrifice, and then there's that transgression of desolation. We know when the transgression of desolation takes place, right? Right, right in the center of the tribulation. We know the tribulation is seven years long, divided into 42 months, uh, 1,260 days, uh, Three and a half years, the whole thing is seven years long. Now you're going to have to do some math. Hopefully I can do it quickly too. <laughs> but anyhow, so they asked how long is that going to take place? So you got the sacrifice going on. You got the desolation that's going to take place. Uh, and then the answer comes back. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Well, for the, for the point of this study... Jesus Christ is going to return after the second half of that tribulation. And, and there's verses about him coming to his sanctuary or coming to his temple. I'm not sure I got all that figured out. But if his return is going to cleanse all of that, then we got a period that's called, oh, let's see if I can write this in a way that you'll see it. 1,200, no. How am I doing that? 2,300 days. And that's going to be, if, if we start this point to be the cleansing of the temple with the return of Christ, then the 1,200 days is going to come out to somewhere in the first half of the tribulation. The way that divides up, if you're going to do your math, that's 220 days in, and then 1,040 days. And the reason I do that is from the beginning of the tribulation to this beginning of the 2,300 days, there's 220 days. And the question is, how long from the daily sacrifice to the desolation until the temple is cleansed? And it's 2,300 days. Now, people have got all kinds of ways of figuring that out. You know, the Seventh-day Adventists say that those 2,300 days is 2,300 days years. And in 1984, no, 1884, is when the temple was cleansed in heaven. And, and they actually picked that because earlier they said in 1843, Jesus Christ was going to return and cleanse the temple. And he didn't come back. So they made it 1885, 18, another 50 something. It didn't happen. So they concluded that the heavenly temple was cleansed in 1884. Because, all based on this prophecy. <laughs> But if we just let those days be what those days are, the question that I always have is when is Israel going to start sacrificing animals again? Well, that means 220 days into the tribulation, the sacrifice begins. 
It ends 1,040 days after that, and the abomination, I should put that all the way to here, then the abomination is set up, and then that's the abomination that brings desolation until Christ comes back and cleanses it all. So you can play with those numbers, but when I look at that, I go, oh, we can go backwards. That's what we did over here on that other prophecy. We went backwards those number of days, and that would tell you that's, that's almost seven months into the tribulation, not seven years, seven months into the tribulation, Israel will not only have a temple, but they'll start offering animal sacrifices. And they'll, they'll do it for, what is that, 35 months? Until the abomination is set up, and he's going to stop the sacrifice. And you know why the Antichrist stops the sacrifice. In Revelation chapter 13, he has a deadly wound. Looks like he dies, and he comes back alive. And now he's going to be the new and living way. He's going to be the one who is, he's a perfect uh, anti-Christ. <laughs> he's going to actually act like he's the one who died, and they don't need any more animal sacrifices for sin. He's the sacrifice, and he's the one who can give them eternal life. And they stop the daily sacrifice, and, and he, he has a host against it to, to end it. And then there's another 1,290, 60 days until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And... Uh, and so, when I, when I look at that, now the, the only other way that it is, is if there's more things that are going to be done after the return of Christ toward cleansing the sanctuary. But that's a whole study about the sanctuary, because how much is it desolated? <laughs> is it even there? Uh, and that's questions that I have. But as far as looking at those verses uh, and those numbers, um, in the past, that's, that's how I look at those numbers and saw that what Daniel is looking for. So, verse 15, Daniel chapter 8, it says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and remember, all this has taken place at that Uli River, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So you know when it talked about one saint said to a certain other saint, there's angelic conversations going on, and even angels asking the question, how long is this going to be? And an angel answers another angel, and then this voice, whether it be the Lord's voice or, or a, a more powerful angel, most likely the Lord's voice, telling Gabriel to go and help Daniel understand the vision. Now this is the first time I believe that Gabriel's name is found in the Bible. It's found several times after that. He's going to appear to Mary. Uh, I think he appears to Daniel one more time. And, uh, and so the, the angel Gabriel, we, we kind of get used to him because of the book of Daniel. He said to go and give Daniel an understanding. Verse 17, so he came near where I stood, and when, I, when he came, I was affrightened and fell on my face. Uh, uh, but he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall the vision be. So he is preparing Daniel to realize the, thing, the events that are going to take place from the Antichrist are going to take place uh, near the time of the end. Now I have a list of just of what we learned about the Antichrist so far. Um, I don't think I want to start into the list. I got what, 10 things that I already in this chapter have identified the Antichrist. And I don't want to start into that list. And, and I don't, certainly don't want to start into Daniel's interpretation at this point. So I think I'm going to stop right there. You have uh, two minutes to ask any questions if you want. <laughs> now I jumped to, instead of showing you the math on that thing, I, I just jumped and showed you the numbers not knowing when that bell was going to ring, but the math isn't important. It's the, it's, it's the C, some explanation to the 2,300 days that the angel gave Daniel a timing there, or another angel that timing. All right, let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you that your Bible is more detailed than we can handle. Uh, but it's not that we can't handle it. Father, it's by your spirit and certainly the help of other teachers uh, that we can be challenged on looking and, and getting an understanding of, of the passage. 
But Father, to, to be able to see that clearly, that what's ahead for the nation of Israel, and to realize there is a temple in the tribulation, and an abomination that's going to take place in the tribulation, and all that still has to happen, and, uh, and to even get some details of some timing of when some events are going to take place, is interesting to us. But we thank you that we live in the age of grace, and while we're in this age, we can certainly uh, proclaim your grace in such a degree that even a Jewish person would understand not to return to the Old Testament system, but to come to Jesus Christ by grace today and then leave a testimony of coming to Christ outside the camp when it comes to the future. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.